So let's get going with the uh, presentation. So the first one up is George Hicks. And George is, has worked for DEEP for 25 years in the municipal water pollution control section. He supervises staff engineers for the planning, design, construction, and financing of upgrades to municipal sewage treatment plants and wastewater collection system. He, de he develops the clean water funding priority list and has served as hearing officer for the priority list since 2008. George also supervises the inspectors and the staff person that administer the nitrogen uh, general permit and the fat oil and grease general permit. George has a bachelor's of science in engineering from UConn and he's a licensed professor engineer in the state of Connecticut. George also is going to introduce Chuck Lee, who's going to be the next uh, speaker. Thank you. This. Uh, good morning, everyone. Before I begin, I'd just like to introduce some of the deep staff that are here today. Uh, we have the uh, division director, Denise Rizika. We have our assistant director, Jennifer Perry. Uh, my counterpart, Roland Denny. Uh, one of the gentlemen, one of the engineers that works with me on the priority list, Syed Bokhari. And then I'll be introducing uh, Chuck Lee at the end of my presentation. Um, we all work in the Water Bureau, and we all work uh, under Denise in the uh, Water Planning and Management Division. These are the topics that I'm going to go through today, um, and I'm going to start off with a legislative update. Uh, when I was here last time, uh, <clears throat> when I was here last time, I talked about what was going on with the state legislature. Uh, the legislative session was uh, still underway. It was about to adjourn. There was a lot of uncertainty relative to the Clean Water Fund program and funding and other pieces of legislation that could impact uh, various projects. So at that time, we had been defending the, uh, the grant funds for the Clean Water Fund program. We developed a justification. We presented it to a legislative committee, and we're waiting to see what uh, the status of that was. In addition to that, prior to the presentation in May, the Office of Fiscal Analysis had presented an update on the budget shortfall. It was $385 million. Um, also debated at that time was Senate Bill uh, 415, an act concerning grants for combined sewer projects. Uh, they were looking at revising the uh, sewage uh, bypass reporting requirements and also continuing education for wastewater operators. So, uh, so what happened? Well, in the end, uh, none of the uh, program funds were cut, which was a good thing. Uh, the Senate bill on grants for combined sewage did not pass. Uh, and then finally, um, they did change the reporting requirements for bypasses, and they did pass uh, continuing education requirements. Those two items were in Public Act uh, 1897. This uh, slide shows a summary of the uh, Clean Water Fund uh, priority list, the current one. So once the, legislation, once the legislative session closed, we were able to complete it. So July 11th, we adopted uh, this priority list. This is a summary of everything. Uh, the top three slides, I mean the top three items in red, those are project commitments. So you can see about two-thirds of the money, we have a total of a billion dollars. Two-thirds are going to treatment plan upgrades. Uh, for 16 treatment plants. We've got CSO work in all four CSO communities, and we have a small community project down Old Lyme. Uh, the items in white are all first come, first serve, so that's still open for you know, anyone that's interested in planning, design, uh, green infrastructure projects, or we've got a fair amount of money in the uh, collection system loan program. Now, since I was here last, uh, we've started the construction of new projects, and uh, this is a list of them. You know, Southington just recently opened bids. And then looking forward to next year for major treatment plant upgrades, we have these five. Um, all five uh, qualify for the 50% uh, the, uh, uh, grant for phosphorus removal. That's out of Public Act uh, 1657. Uh, 
Collectively, they total $350 million. Four out of five of them are major treatment plant upgrades. Um, and they all have the same deadline where the town has to enter into a construction contract by June 30th of 2019. Uh, what's going to be a challenge here is that all these projects right now are tentatively scheduled to go to bid around the same time. So anything that could be done to spread that out would certainly be beneficial to both our program and likely to the, uh, the cost of the projects. Now, all those are in the design phase, and this slide really speaks to any project in design, but what we would prefer is for these items on this slide that we actually get this uh, submitted to us, to us for review in advance of the final design. That way, you know, we can uh, work through this instead of trying to get it all done at the last minute. Um, those projects are all under a very tight time deadline. It's going to be tight for us to get the reviews done. It's going to be tight for the consultants to get their work done. So anything that we can get in advance is really going to help, you know, both us and the towns and the consultants. And, and, you know, be mindful of some things, you know, like one item here is on permits. Don't forget that sometimes, you know, these projects require a flood management certificate. We've had cases where the project gets bid, the bids are open, it hasn't been applied for, and that's just another, you know, delay in time to move the project forward. Uh, looking forward for the, uh, the funding of the program, uh, we have enough funds currently to get through into this coming winter. So tentatively, we're targeting going to the State Bond Commission uh, for the January meeting, and we're looking at $530 million. With that funding, that should get us through to probably, you know, next summer with the projects that we have underway. Looking beyond that is the next two-year budget, <clears throat> which will be debated this legislative session. So in August, we filed a capital budget request with OPM um, for $150 million in grant. It's a bit lower than normally it's been. A lot of that's based upon, you know, the project's readiness to proceed to construction. Uh, but that money is essential to move, you know, the next two project years' worth of work forward. So we'll have the November elections. The governor, we'll have a new governor. He'll meet with the OPM staff. And then the governor and OPM will work on a draft capital budget. And, you know, we're hoping that, uh, you know, our request will be met in that, in that draft budget. That budget will be debated this winter. And it may be an issue that, you know, your organization may want to track and see how things are going relative to that. I mentioned previously the Public Act. This Public Act dealt with two issues, an act concerning the Sewage Spill Right to Know Act and expanding continuing education programs for wastewater operators. So I'll talk to each one. Uh, relative to sewage spill and bypass reporting, um, currently if you've had your NIPIS permit renewed, uh, you have a requirement for electronic reporting. But this act requires by law that you have to start doing electronic reporting by this past July. Same notification as before to our notification, but unlike before, we had submitted fax to our office. Now it has to be done electronically. In addition to that, there's another requirement on top for the towns. If you've got to spill over 5,000 gallons, you have to notify the chief elected official of your community. And then depending on the nature of that spill, and if it could have an impact with downstream community, you need to notify their public officials and the public. Now, electronic reporting isn't new, um, and we've been doing a lot of uh, training. Our staff has. It's been, uh, you know, Ann Stroud, Von Hall, Ileana Rafa. We started this training back in May 2016. And uh, we just had another training session, I believe, two days ago. But prior to that, we had done 40 sessions. It covered 100 utilities and 340 people that got trained. So that's the overwhelming majority, but not everyone's using the system. Because as of that time, 80% of the utilities had been trained and 77% were using them. So if you haven't gone through and done the training, please do so. The other part of that um, public act dealt with the uh, continuing ed education requirements for wastewater operators. This is effective October 1st. It's six hours of continuing education each year. 
The records have to be kept by the operator and the plant that employs the operator, and they need to be available for our review. That's all the Act says. Um, now, this legislation was supported by your organization and by the CWPAA. We think it was great legislation. We see a lot of benefits to continuing education for the operators. You know, it's the development of new skills. It keeps them current with updated practices. You know, it can improve their job performance and productivity. If they take enough of these classes, then they are, uh, they'll be able to sit for the next operator certification exam. But in essence, to move up the, corp the career ladder in this field, you need to have continuing education. Since the passage of this uh, requirement, we've received many questions relative to what it means. So I'll just read through a few of them. Does DEEP approve or disapprove the courses before they're held? What happens if DEEP doesn't approve the courses I've taken? Can I lose my operator certification for not meeting the requirement? Do I need to send anything to DEEP to show proof of meeting the continuing education requirement? And is continuing education a condition of my operator certification renewal? I think they're all great questions, um, but what does the legislation say? That's all it talks to. You know, it doesn't talk about us having, you know, being able to approve or disapprove courses. It doesn't talk about suspension of a operator certification. It doesn't speak to documentation submission or even to operator certification renewal requirements. Uh, we're looking at how we're going to administer this now. We'll be putting a, a document uh, distributed through the listserv and on our website shortly so that, you know, hopefully it will answer all the questions that we're getting relative to, uh, to this issue. Another area that uh, I thought I would raise is inspection. Um, each year we work with EPA to come up with a compliance monitoring strategy, and that's our minimal requirement with EPA uh, as far as the type of inspections that they want us to perform. And it's pretty similar from year to year, and this year it's 31 inspections of plants that discharge over a million gallons a day, six inspections for those that are under a million, one CSO inspection, and four uh, sanitary sewer overflow inspections. Two of those performed by our office and two of them will be performed by EPA. Now, some of the problems that we typically see, you know, our inspectors report back to me um, are the items, you know, on the slide. Lack of proper record keeping and documentation. In the lab, you know, it's on the bench sheets or it's on the equipment calibration records. At the treatment plant, in the collection system, it's lack of maintenance records. Occasionally, we run into cases where there's a major piece of equipment that's offline for an extended period of time. Now, that piece of equipment doesn't necessarily have a direct impact on the uh, effluent leaving the plant, but you're obligated by permit to operate and maintain everything that's in your plant, that's been approved in plans and specifications, and that's in your own manual. Uh, if you choose to take it offline, you actually need permission from our our agency to do that. Effluent violations are, you know, an obvious one, but you know, usually we're looking at things where it's a continuous series of violations, not the occasional uh, time where it goes out of compliance. Odor problems, um, we recognize that, you know, you're, we're not working with a perfume factory out there, um, but occasionally we run into cases where the odor control systems are down, we're getting complaints. Lack of timely attention to an operational issue or lack of proper notification on bypasses. When our inspectors are done, you can expect to get the inspection report. And then, you know, you may get from them, a, it could be a letter, it could be an email, you know, directing, you know, some nominal amount of work. So it would be, you know, it would help us that you address these issues quickly and respond back to us that you've taken care of these matters. Um, if it's a little bit more serious, you can get a notice of violation. Usually if it's something that could be resolved in 90 days, it may be a notice of violation. But if it's something more significant or it could take longer, it's an administrative order. And occasionally, um, you know, those are issued as well. For the certified operators in Connecticut, this is the universe that uh, we work with. There's over 900 operators, and you can see that they're pretty equally uh, spread out between the class one and two and three exams, and 
a little bit less on the class four, but we only have 62 municipal class four plants, so there seems to be enough um, operators to be able to, uh, to accommodate that. This is the typical exam pass rate that we're seeing. Our next exam is scheduled for January 9th, and then the application deadline is November 20th. Recently, ABC that writes um, without our input, the class one and two exams, they, they modified the exam and it was first administered last July. And we saw the pass rate drop to roughly half of what's on the screen. So we contacted them about it and they didn't seem to be concerned and they said, well, that happens when we, we uh, modify the exam and generally it corrects itself fairly quickly. So we'll have to uh, track that and see what's, you know, how that's gonna turn out. Construction contract change orders. Uh, seems to be a little bit of confusion. We put some guidance on our website on this. Um, if you have a construction contract change order in excess of $100,000, it needs prior approval before you authorize the work to be done by the contractor. Otherwise, it may jeopardize your clean water funding. So the question is, how do you calculate the $100,000? So this is, you know, a, the, you know, you can think of about any way you can come up with $100,000. So it could be a single item increase or a decrease of $100,000 that would fall under this guidance. Um, to, total value of the change order is $100,000. Well, the change order could be less than $100,000, but the sum of all the increases could be over 100, or the sum of all the decreases could be over, over $100,000. So uh, just pay attention to this when you're working on change orders and seek prior approval uh, so you don't run the risk of not being funded for that change order. In, in summary, I think that everything is going along pretty well with the Clean Water Fund. Um, we have the November election. We'll have to see what happens at that point in time. First test will be, you know, whether we get on the bond commission for the $530 million this January. Uh, next is, you know, what does the capital budget look like? I want to thank everyone for complying with the uh, electronic reporting requirements. Um, you know, we've got great turnout. Everyone, you know, is, is doing a great job on that. If your uh, facility isn't doing it, please get trained. Be on the lookout for guidance on our continuing education requirement. Uh, if you have not signed up for our municipal wastewater listserv, please do so. That's how we communicate with uh, most people. Keep up the good work of all the uh, treatment plant upgrades you're doing, uh, working in the collection system and, and meeting your permit. If you have any questions, please feel to see me or you know, any other staff that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation.